Lord, I need your spirit to proclaim your word faithfully. This church needs your spirit to receive your word. Lord, we are so dependent on your spirit. And you give him so freely. Free gift of grace. Because you have done all of the work for us. You lived for us. You died for us. You rose for us. You ascended for us. And now we receive salvation in you. We praise you. It's why we're here. It's why we're worshiping. It's why we're sitting under your word. Lord, I pray that you would prepare hearts to receive your word this morning. Lord, as we glory in your coming. As we see the the culmination of the storyline of your kingship, the storyline of all of creation and all of reality, really, Lord, would we submit ourselves to you as the rightful king of kings. Jesus, it is in your name and for your sake we pray, amen. Would you stay standing as we read God's word this morning? Uh, your word for this morning is Revelation 19, 11 through 21. You can turn there or it's up on the screen. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he's called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You may be seated. That's a passage that kind of blows the hair back a little bit, huh? It's a, it's a spy, it makes for a spicy Sunday morning. Well, let me ask you this. Did you know that Joy to the World is not a Christmas song? Did you know that? Uh, you'd be forgiven for thinking it was a Christmas song. We sing it weekly every Christmas, right? And, and it works well enough as a Christmas song. But most people don't actually know that. Joy to the world is not about Christmas because there's no baby, there's no manger, there's no virgin, there's no star, no wise men, no camels. Joy to the world is not a hymn extolling the glories of Christ's first coming. It's actually extolling the glories of Christ's second coming. So, We're going to throw the lyrics to Joy to the World up on the screen here, and what you will find is the kingship of Christ, fully consummated over all of creation. Look at these uh, these worlds, these words. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and, and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. He rules the world 
with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. In Joy to the World, we see a picture of Christ as king, ruling over a restored and welcoming creation. Y'all, we get to talk about that reality this morning. We get to glory in the blessed hope of a creation fully united with its true Lord. This is our title for this morning. We get to talk about the return of the triumphant king. Because you've been studying Advent, right? This is an Advent series. You've been learning all about the kingship of Christ. We saw the first king, Adam, who, who failed in his job as vice ruler over all of creation. And then we've seen God's cleanup efforts through human kings who fail over and over like David. And, and it requires this coming one, this son of David, this true king who will rule on the throne eternally. And you met him last week, right? What's his name? It's G- you can say it a little louder than that. It's Jesus. It's King Jesus who has come. And so what I hope to do this morning is I want to raise your hearts up to heavenly places. I want to elevate your affections so high that you leave glorying in the hope that is rightly yours in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the lines have fallen for us in pleasant places. We have a good inheritance laid up for us. And because of that, there's no need to fear. You ready? Let's do it. So here's our big idea for this morning. Pretty simple. I've pretty much already said it. Find your hope in the return of the triumphant king. Find your hope in the return of the triumphant king. That's what I want you to get out of this this morning because I believe that's what God's word is putting forward. And so we're going to look at two portraits of Christ's coming from the book of Revelation. And in all of this, my goal is your joy and your hope if your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you haven't already, turn with me to Revelation 19. Now, Revelation is a book that strikes fear in the heart of many believers, right? And, and we should approach it with some fear and trepidation. It's very weird. It's very different from most of the scriptures. And everyone has like an uncle or someone who tends to read the newspaper through the lens of Revelation and wants to talk about it all the time, right? And so we, we have all of these associations with the book of Revelation. But I am excited to preach this book because this book has been a source of hope for my heart. Revelation is all about hope, you guys. It's all about hope. It's hope for the persecuted people of God. And so over and over and over across the book of Revelation, you'll see the word conquer. It's It's a key theme in the book of Revelation, conquering. And conquering is revelation language for Christians who persevere in faith all the way until eternity. That's what it means to conquer in Revelation. And so you'll see, blessed is the one who conquers, I will give him this reward. Blessed is the one who conquers, I'll give him this reward over and over and over. It's all about persevering in hope. And so we are going to spend this morning looking at hope. And thankfully, we get to skip most of the debates because we're looking at some passages that pretty much everybody agrees are about the end of history. So saves me some work. Here is the first facet of Christ's coming. First thing you need to see, Christ is coming as the conquering king. Is everyone in Revelation 19 by now? Okay, good job, guys. I'm gonna take a sip of this water. So we started in verse 11. And what we see in Revelation 19, 11, the apostle John, he receives yet another in a long line of visions. That's kind of how this book works. And so he looks up, and in verse 11, what does he see? Somebody tell me. What does he see? You can just shout it out. Yeah. He sees a white horse. And more importantly, he sees a rider on that white horse. The rider is the focus. And his appearance is striking. He's got flaming eyes, these eyes that see all. His head is covered in diadems. What's a diadem? That's a crown, yeah. Now, put on your thinking caps. How many crowns does a king usually wear? One. Yeah, but how many crowns does this rider have? Many. 
Yeah, he's got a ton. Implication, this rider, he wears all the crowns because he rules all the kingdoms. He's not just the king. He is the king of the kings. Right? Sometimes we call that an emperor, someone who rules over multiple kingdoms. God in the Bible does not look favorably upon emperors typically. Right? To be king over many peoples transcends the boundaries of nature. It's characteristic of evil cities like Babylon and Rome. Across the book of Revelation, the only other ones who wear multiple crowns are the dragon and the beast. But this one... This rider is different. He's different. He wears all the crowns because he is the rightful ruler of all the kings. Church, this is your savior. This is your savior coming as the king of all kings. He's here. And his robe is dipped in blood. Why? Well, it's because he's the one who fulfills Isaiah 63, 1 through 3. In that passage, Isaiah asks, Who is this who comes from Edom, in crimsoned garments from Bozrah, he who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength? And the one who's coming responds, he says, It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Isaiah asks, Why is your apparel red? Why are your garments like his who treads on the winepress? And he responds, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. It's a, it's a grotesque picture. It's a picture of the wrath of God. And verse 15 in our passage concurs. This rider, your savior, is going to tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. It's not his blood on his robe. We saw his blood earlier when he appeared as a lamb that was slain. No, 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 this is his enemy's blood. They're squished like grapes. Do you have room in your theology for a Jesus who returns violently? Do you? So let me, let me rephrase that question. Do you have room in your theology to love the violent return of King Jesus? Might seem like an odd question. Might feel uncomfortable. Maybe it's difficult to process, but we need to learn to love the violent return of King Jesus because what is his name in this passage? Kind of a trick question. He gets a couple names. He's called Faithful and True, He's called the Word of God. He's called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he actually gets a, a secret name, which is kind of indicative of him fulfilling God's purposes for him successfully. And so if he is faithful and true, if he's the Word of God, like he is God's very self-revelation to mankind, he is the most accurate picture of God that we have ever received, then it has to be good that he returns violently. It has to be an act of love on his part. It has to be a blessing for his people. Can you love the violent return of King Jesus? If you can't, if that's difficult, perhaps that's a challenge. Maybe you don't appreciate, first off, what it takes to actually be king. And then, maybe if it seems weird that Christ would return this way, if it's, it's a tough pill to swallow, then maybe that means you don't actually hate sin enough to want to see it trampled out. Perhaps that's what that means. You're not rightly esteeming the evil of sin. If this seems wrong to you, perhaps that means you've drunk too deep of the spirit of the age, which demands politeness from Christians above all other things. Believer, your king is not polite. He returns violently. Your king will conquer violently. And if you're unwilling to love this aspect of his coming, might I suggest that your sensibilities may have become an idol for you. And on top of that, you're going to be doubly uncomfortable when he actually returns because according to verse 14, you're riding right behind him. Look at verse 14. It says, The armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. 
That's you, if your faith is in Christ. That's you on your own white horse, robed in your own good works. That's verse eight. And just riding your horse absolutely enthralled by the victory that your king is winning on your behalf. That's you. If, if you look back to verses six and through 10, we didn't read them, but they're the context here. What you'll find is this is actually the church's wedding to Jesus. The church is the bride of Christ, right? And this is, this is part of the wedding. And so Christ is conquering the wicked nations as a wedding present for his people. That's what he's doing here. And that's verses 17 through 21. It's all out destruction of the beast. The beast across Revelation symbolizes all these godless governmental systems. And it's destruction of the false prophet who symbolizes all godless religious systems and everyone who follows them instead of following Christ. Maybe I'm going to get myself in a little bit of trouble here, but not much. But this is Christ's wedding present to his bride. You guys. You should love the violent return of Christ because when he returns in this way, that means he's destroying everything that stands against him. And that means he's destroying everything that stands against you. He's conquering for his glory and he's conquering for you. And it feels like there's a lot that stands against us today, doesn't it? There's a lot to fear, right? Doesn't it feel like the world is getting worse? It feels like things are spiraling out of control. Is anyone of you afraid for your future, let alone the future of your kids or your grandkids? Because there's a chance, decent chance, you might have to suffer in your stand against evil. Or worse, there's a decent chance that people you love might be overtaken by evil. There's a lot to fear. And that evil that you fear, you can find it here in this passage, in verse 21 laying dead on the battlefield. Christ conquers that evil. An oppressive government that taxes what's good and subsidizes what's evil, that's the beast. And you can find it in verse 20, being cast into the lake of fire because Christ conquers that beast. The godless ideologies and worldviews that so permeate our culture that they feel inescapable. That's the false prophet. It's in the lake with the beast. Christ conquers the false prophet. You guys, you need to know this morning that however embattled you feel, and and you are in a battle, but however embattled you feel, the evil that you feel powerless against will be utterly crushed under the foot of Jesus when he returns utterly and completely, and you are going to sit behind him on your horse doing nothing but admiring his inestimable power. That is your role, and that is your king. And so you need a conquering, violent king because that's the kind of king that can put down your enemies and can put down his enemies, and he will. And so this is a call to faith and to confidence for believers in Christ. You may have to die for Christ. You may. You will certainly struggle for Christ, at least in the battle against sin, let alone against persecution. But there is an expiration date on the struggle. It's like the hardest workout of your life, but it's almost done, and the coach is like in your face counting down like five seconds, five more, give me one more rep, one more rep, right? You can push through it because you know there's an end. The timer is about to go off, y'all, and so you need to find strength to persevere through the Spirit of Christ, and if you're here this morning and you're an enemy of Christ, then you need to see your fate here in this passage, you will be conquered by the coming king. You will. An enemy, by the way, just to to be clear, because you're like, "Eh, I don't really hate Jesus. An enemy is anyone who doesn't trust Christ for salvation. That's an enemy of Christ. And so if you haven't put your faith in Christ, you are dead in your sin. You stand under the wrath of God. You are the grape. But here's the good news. (laughs) You don't have to be. It doesn't have to be that way. You can flee to this king before he comes and you can beg for mercy because he is infinitely merciful. 
He loves to forgive. He loves to show grace. He wants you as a friend, not a rebel. He doesn't want you as an enemy. He wants you as part of his bride. And so if you are his enemy this morning, flee to him. Confess your sin. Trust that Christ died in your place so you can escape the wrath of God and turn from that sin. There is still time. So our first portrait we see is that Christ comes as the conquering king. He puts down his enemies and he he hands a world rid of evil to his bride as a wedding present. But it, it's not just like the bad guys are removed. And he, he's not just the conqueror. He is that, but he's not just that. So let's, let's keep going in the book of Revelation and let's see the second portrait. The return of the triumphant king. Christ is coming as the restorative ruler. Christ is coming as the restorative ruler. And so this is gonna be kind of our path here. We're going to go back to the beginning of Revelation, and then we're going to jump back to the end. So let's, let's head back to the very beginning. Revelation starts with an image of the glorified Christ. He shows up to John. He's absolutely radiant. Every inch of him is some sort of Old Testament reference, which, by the way, that's the, the key to understanding this book. This is why I'm convinced that you today can go home and actually understand the book of Revelation and the hope that it has to offer. If you really get to know your Old Testament, Revelation will be self-explanatory, or at least mostly self-explanatory. But the Old Testament is the key to this book. That was free. So, Revelation starts with this image of the glorified Christ, and and Christ through John is writing letters to seven of these churches, calling them to faithfulness, calling them to purity, calling them to conquer, and giving them various Old Testament promises if they do. And and then we keep going and we get to Revelation chapter 4, and the crazy images start. And the first thing John sees is an image of a throne a giant king's throne. And there's someone sitting on the throne, and, and he's, he looks like glistening jewels, the jewels from the high priest's ephod. We have a glorious king. And surrounding his throne, there are worshipers, and there's thunder and lightning, and the Holy Spirit is just hanging out there, which is insane all by itself. And there's a sea of clear glass. And so this is the first time a human has stood above the expanse of Genesis 1 and then actually written about it. This is a vision of God as king over all of creation. And the one on the throne has a scroll, sealed with seals. It symbolizes the outworking of all history. Let's actually, let's, let's read this in Revelation chapter five. Revelation five, verse one, it's too good to skip. John says, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You guys got to hear the words to this song. They sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people from every, people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. 
you catch that? Christ established a kingdom when he died. By ransoming a worldwide people, he made a kingdom built of various nations. Christ became the rightful emperor on the cross. And because of his work, he alone rules as the worthy sovereign over history. He's the only one who's authorized to make history tick along. It fulfills his purposes. God's plans for all the world are being fulfilled purely because the lamb died and he ransomed and he conquered and he rose and now he can open the seals. He is making history happen. And so every event that has ever occurred, every grand world event, every tiny little moment in your life ripples out from those three days when Christ died and rose. And so what we see here then is that the God who was king over all by virtue of his very existence, he stepped into history, he became a human, and then he re-earned the right to be king over all as the God-man. Wild. The gospel is insane, you guys. It's so good. And this is where Revelation starts. That Christ is already king. He's already ruling over everything. And so all the crazy stuff that happens in this book, it all happens under his kingship. It's under his rule. There is a right way to read this book. It does mean something. But regardless of where you fall on the details, it's non-negotiable. You have to read Revelation as the outworking of Christ's kingship. You will miss it if you don't see that. And so now we can jump back to the end of the book. So turn to chapter 21, and we're going to take a look at the world that Christ is bringing with him. Because he's ruling now, right? He's like actually king over history right now. But one day it's going to be better, right? We're looking forward to something. This isn't the best that we get. A, a great poet once said, in every place he rules, but there he reigns. There is his citadel and lofty seat. Happy the soul who to his bliss attains. He's ruling everywhere, but he's reigning in heaven. And we are awaiting a day when that distinction is gone. And everything is like heaven. His reign will be perfectly felt in the new heavens and new earth. Let's get a taste of it. Revelation 21, start at the beginning. Verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be, them as their, be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. A new heavens and a new earth. Or perhaps better, a renewed heavens and a renewed earth so qualitatively different from what we see now that the purity of the eternal king's very being is felt perfectly in everything he has created. Think, like, because this is how the Bible pictures it, right? Think this earth, but no more crying. No more mourning. No more death. No more loss. No more li decay. No more pain. Why? Because everything has become the holy of holies. It says, the dwelling place of God is with man. So the original problem, the curse of King Adam's sin, which separated us all from perfect union and fellowship with God, it's gone. It's been undone problem solved, never to be seen again. 
This is Emmanuel. This is God with us. That truth, which is true now, becomes all of reality. And so just imagine some of the the normal things that you do. Driving in a world where God is perfectly present. Man, that'd be a lot different. My attitude would be a lot different. Working in a world where God is perfectly present. Church in a world where God is perfectly present. I can't wait. Then if we keep going, we get a vision in verse 9 of the church. The, The angel says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And then he immediately begins describing a city. So that's weird. Did, did Jesus marry a city? Actually, kind of, yeah. Um, Paul calls the church the Jerusalem above. And in Hebrews, he describes Abraham's hope as a city with foundations. Abraham's faith was in a heavenly Jerusalem, which is all the elect of God's people gathered from all of history. And he describes this city descending from heaven, and and he measures it, which is kind of a weird thing to do when you see a giant city falling from heaven. So he gets out the tape measure, and he measures it, and it's it's a perfect cube. Does anyone know what the only other perfect cube is in the Bible? The Holy of Holies. It's the only one. The place where God's presence is uniquely felt on earth. The city, which is his bride, has the same dimensions. And it is covered in 12 precious stones. It's inscribed with the name of the 12 tribes. Its dimensions are all multiples of 12. This is the fullness of the people of God and the fullness of the promises of God across all of Scripture, now perfectly revealed and fulfilled in you, Christ's bride. What a hope. Like everything you've ever hoped for in Christ, every promise you've ever read, every text you've ever puzzled over, because it it says if I pray, it'll be a yes, but I haven't felt my yes yet. This is your yes in full, complete perfection. Keep going. Revelation 21, verse 22. And I saw no temple in the city, For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Now the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. So remember like the first 10 chapters of First Kings, which was probably what, like April in the Bible reading plan. So it was, it was a ways ago. But first 10 chapters, Solomon is king. He's ruling over Jerusalem. And it seems like everyone in the world is coming from far and wide to bring the best that their nation has to offer before God's king. They're all flocking to God's mountain to see God's man in the place where God's presence is. The new heavens and new earth is that on steroids. Every nation's particular glory. Their uniqueness preserved and yet at the same time united as one under the banner of Christ in a perfect world. Because Christ alone is the emperor. He alone is the king over all kings. And and because of that, the kings of the world are freed to do their job perfectly and completely for all eternity in the new heavens and new earth. That's a beautiful reality, right? Every hope that you have for those who are in authority over you to do the right thing, or some of you might be smirking now because you used to have that hope, but you've gotten cynical over the years, all of that hope, that becomes a reality in the new heavens and new earth. Righteous rulers, nations rightly ordered, praise God. The king is coming, and he's bringing restoration with him. Let's keep going into chapter 22, and then we can land the plane here. Revelation 22, verse 1. 
the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from, where is it flowing from? The throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. What a world. I don't even have to preach that passage. It preaches itself, right? Curse eradicated because God is here. We can eat from the tree of life again. God and simultaneously the Lamb reigning on the throne in the center of all of creation, proving that indeed Christ is the second person of the Trinity, the divine Son. We're marked with God's name in this new world. We're worshiping him always. We're reigning on our own mini thrones with him. When he became king, he earned kingship for us as well praise god and in this city in his light we see light and so christian let me ask you do you hope for that world is that is that where your hope is today because like that world's coming it will be here and if you are found in christ all of this is yours already won by the finished work of the Lord Jesus. If you have trusted in him, if you have received his righteousness by faith, this is your future. Not can be, is. And if this is your future, then why do you fear? I mean, really. Like, this is right around the corner. It's just just a few short years away right? In 2024, you are one year closer to this happening. In your afflictions, you are being prepared for this. Believer in Christ, have hope in the world where the king is fully present and has restored all things. We pray. Lord Jesus, I kind of don't even know what to say uh, because the glory of what you have revealed, uh, I'll just taint it with my lowly words. Thank you. Maybe that's the right thing to say. Thank you. Thank you for giving us this inheritance. Thank you for giving us this promise and this hope. May we live in light of it. May this permeate 2024, the hope of future glory with you, the restorative ruler and the conquering king. Lord, raise, raise dead hearts to life here this morning for those who haven't trusted in you, for those who are still your enemies, who will be trampled underfoot. Lord, send your spirit to bring them to life so that they could see your glory and bow a knee to you in faith. Jesus, it's in your name and for your sake we pray. Amen. Well, so many thoughts are running through my mind as we transition into communion here because when we eat and drink this cup we proclaim the lord's death until he comes right so this is this is a meal for believers that we're about to do so if you're not a christian in here please don't take this meal it's not for you or if you're a christian and you're unreconciled to a fellow believer or not in good standing with the local church Please don't take this meal. Please, please reconcile first because this is a covenant meal. Right? Th- this has covenant blessings attached and that means this has covenant curses attached. And so by eating it and drinking it in an unworthy manner, you would be drinking those curses on yourself. And, and I don't want that for you. So please refrain if this is not for you. But if this is for you, partake joyfully. This is so fitting for our message this morning. Right? This is an end 
times meal. It's a prophetic meal. You are actually prophesying by taking this meal this morning because we are pointing forward to the coming of Christ. And in this meal, we remember what Christ did in his life, in his death, in his resurrection to save us from sin and to give us this hope. And in this meal, we spiritually feast on Christ. And in doing so, we're actually awaiting the day that we will see him face to face. And he will be our light. In fact, this is one of the only things that we do that he isn't doing right now. He, he takes the meal with his disciples, he establishes it, and then he says, you know what, guys, I'm going to wait, actually, until we're all gathered together again as one church, and then I'm going to take it with you. Right? And so this is pointing forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so th- really, the communion meal preaches my entire sermon again, if you listen closely. It's the judgment of sinners as Christ's wedding present to his church foretold in this meal the perfect fellowship of God and his people foretold in this meal. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. That's the truth that we eat and drink. And so I'm gonna step down, uh, come up with me, grab the elements, and then go back to your seats, and I will lead us in taking this together.